of Straight Talk from Israel. You're listening to Israel News Talk Radio. to get your spouse on board with moving to Israel, with making Aliyah. You know, there are a lot of Jews today. In fact, the Israeli government is saying that they're expecting perhaps up to 90,000 new immigrants from North America to Israel this year. But not all spouses are on the same page when it comes to picking up their families and moving. So I'm going to try to give you some tips today on the show how to get your spouse to want to make Aliyah or to let you both making Aliyah. And I think that they're pretty good positive tips and uh, you can decide for yourself. I had a letter uh, that was sent to me by one of our listeners with this query. She said, what do I do? And, and, and she wants to know these, uh, these ideas of what to do. So I'm going to share them with you. Also, I'm very excited to tell you all that Israel News Talk Radio is going to be adding to its shows, its program lineup, two new Aliyah shows, two shows that are going to be concentrating on moving to Israel. One is going to be called Israel Unplugged. That's going to be airing every Monday at this time, 9 a.m. U.S. Eastern Time or 4 p.m. Israel Time. And Thursday, uh, a new show called Returning Home. And that's going to air Thursdays at the same time, 4 p.m. Israel time, 9 a.m. U.S. Eastern time. These are both going to be live shows where you can call in and join the hosts on the air, ask your questions, make a comment, whatever it is that you want to do. So join us there. Join us in the chat room as well. You can write down your thoughts and things. And if the hosts have time and can read it, they can maybe respond to it on the air as well. All right. So the, all of this is uh, coming up. It's very exciting. I'm going to be actually interviewing one of the hosts of these new shows on my program today. So you're already going to get a sneak peek into the Aliyah show coming up this week, starting this week. All right. Wow. I'm so excited. Join us here in the chat room. Write your questions down or your comments. We'd love to read them and see you from all over the world. We'll be right back, everybody. Don't go anywhere. Always challenging the status quo. Hello, I'm Rod Bryant on Beyond the Matrix here at IsraelNewsTalkRadio.com. I want to encourage you to listen each week, every Wednesday at the same time, for an amazing show that will challenge you, inform you, and inspire. News, views, and wisdom for the nations here on IsraelNewsTalkRadio.com. Don't forget, Beyond the Matrix every week, Wednesday, here on IsraelNewsTalkRadio.com. We are back here at the Tamar Yona Show on IsraelNewsTalkRadio.com. And as I said in the beginning of the program, we are adding to our lineup two new shows to our program schedule that are both going to be concentrating on moving to Israel, on Aliyah. And I'm very, very excited to introduce one of the hosts that's going to be airing every Thursday afternoon Israel time at 4 p.m. live. That means if you... Uh, have a question or a comment or, uh, or anything like that, you can join, uh, our guest. Her name is Natalie Sopinski. She's going to, going to be hosting a new show called Returning Home. And, uh, she's going to be talking about lots of stuff that have to do with Aliyah. And let's just, uh, bring her on right now. Shalom, Natalie. Shalom, Tamar. Thank you for having me. All right. So your uh, promo is already playing in our live stream. It's uh, how did a girl from Delaware end up in Israel? Something like that. And uh, (laughs) a nice Jewish girl from Delaware end up in Israel. So why don't you tell us first a bit about yourself and then about the show and what you plan to do with this program? 
Fine, sure. Thank you. Um, yeah, I have a kind of, I guess, a little unusual Aliyah story because I didn't have Israel in my life at all or in my family's life at all. It was not something I knew about. I even had a copy of a report about Israel from my sister when I was in sixth grade. I didn't know anything. Um, but yeah, I'll get into that in our first show. Uh, I'll, I'll talk a, a little bit about myself. But I, I ended up here, changed my whole life. Um, and I live in the southern Hebron Hills in, a, in, a, in an Israeli community, an Israeli yeshuv. And there are very few Anglos down here in the Hebron Hills. There are maybe 20 spread throughout the different communities. There are about 25 different yeshuvim here. Maybe 20 uh, English speakers, not even Americans. And whenever I hear about Aliyah, I get very excited because I think, wow, if, if I had met someone when I was 18 years old and told me about Israel, I would have made this change so much earlier. Um, I didn't move here till I was 30, 32. So, so I am passionate about Aliyah, and uh, I'm very excited to, to help whoever has questions and whoever is, you know, scared and whoever is is not sure because there is so much you can do here. I mean, all you need is a, a sense of adventure and you'll be fine. Okay. Uh, well, some people will say a sense of adventure is all nice, but you have to make a living. So what would you answer them? That's right. So you make your living, you know, people here speak English, people here use computers, there's electricity, there's indoor plumbing, you can do a lot of things here that you probably do there. Um, I'm a trademark attorney. And I came here and I kept working and this is back in 2005. There was no, you know, there was no ways there was no, uh, no a lot of things that we have today we didn't have. I used email. Um, you can also retrain. You can learn to do something and look at it as an opportunity to change your life and do something you never wanted, you, you always wanted to do, but never had the opportunity. You could look at it like that. I became a fundraiser five years ago for Yeshiva here in Susia. I knew nothing about it. They needed someone who spoke English. Okay, and, for everybody who doesn't know what Susia is, Susia is a community that is located between Jerusalem and Beersheba. If you're a little bit familiar with the, with the map of Israel, it's south of Jerusalem, north of Beersheba, and it's a beautiful, lovely uh, suburban community there. Some people call it a settlement. I call it a resettlement because we are back there after 2,000 years. And in fact, Natalie, you have by you a, a very ancient synagogue where they show the mosaic tiles from 2,000 years ago that was in Susia. Right? That's right. That's right. And the original is in the Israel Museum. It's very exciting. Yeah, I remember um, I, I visited that. That was very yeah. exciting. Yeah, oh, yeah. Okay. All right. So uh, so what's going to be on your show? So our show is going to be basically reaching out to people who want to live in Israel, who want to move to Israel and have questions. We're going to help them with housing. We're going to help them with banking. We're going to help them with employment, with health care, with education. All these questions, they're going to pepper us with these questions. And we're going to provide as much information as we can live on the air and direct people to get more information. Because, you know, the radio is, is so great. It's for people who maybe aren't so savvy on the computer. There are people who don't run a text, who don't know how to use Facebook, who don't use a computer so well. That's why your show is gold for, the, for those people who just want to talk and want to hear a real human, a real person who's maybe going through what they're going through. We're also going to interview people on their on their journey that are making Aliyah, that are in the process of moving to Israel. We're going to follow them week by week. That should be uh, very, very exciting. And we're going to focus on different communities here and, spe and people who have already made their trip, made their move, and we're going to interview them week by week also, and we'll see how they're adjusting. So basically, it sounds like the whole foundation, people need to know uh, and when, when they're moving to a new place, they need to A, get a home, B, get a job, get their kids into schools, B, uh, find a, you know, find a, a, and build a new life there. And you're going to be covering all of that, it sounds like. That's right. That's what we're going to try to do. We're, we're really going to try to do that and um, alleviate people's fears and try to address their concerns and, okay. you know, encourage them because everyone can do it. It's not the Israel from the 1950s. It's a modern state. There's everything here. You can have a good life here. We do. What, what, what's the best thing that you found about living in Israel, moving, having moved here and living here now? Lots. I have a lot. I wasn't prepared for that kind of question. I have a lot. Uh, my children, 
I think. Uh, this is this. These are the kind of children I wanted. They are strong. They're independent. They're no nonsense about who they are, about being Jews. They're strong Jews. I wanted strong Jewish children. Um, they know their history. They know where they're from. They know where they're going. They're proud. I love that. That I love. Uh, today, my 14-year-old just left the house. He is going to the Canara with his friends. He's the Canara is the Sea of Galilee up north near Tiberias, for anybody who doesn't it. know what the Canara what the is. It's the only natural lake in Israel, I think. Um, this is where everyone goes in the summer when it's hot. Half the country's up there now. And he's going with his friends. He's 14. He's going on his own. I'm not worried. I'm not worried. And uh, every year, the kids go off on their own with their friends. And they hitchhike. And they take buses. And they, they manage. They it's safe to hitchhike? Stars. They hitchhike. I hitchhike. We hitchhike here. Yeah. Yeah, it's yeah. very, very normal. Uh, it, hitchhiking is very the norm here in Israel. You should just know everybody because uh, we're all one big family. That's how we feel. And uh, there's lots of families traveling. They see somebody on the side of the road and they'll pick them up and take them, give them something to eat right. in the car. <laughs> right, right, right. It's great. It's great. It's like one big JCC. That's yeah, I- <laughs> right. But, and of course, you have to be careful. You know, you never you don't want to get into a, a, a car, God forbid, of a terrorist, but it, it doesn't happen. Thank God it, it doesn't happen often. Um, and and pretty much kids know what they're doing. And um, yeah, well, there, you just have to. Yeah. There's certain there are certain precautions like yes. uh, I tell my kids go with someone with a big mouth, go with someone who's older than you, go with you know yeah you you, yeah. you don't you know you'd be smart. Have your GPS and, on. Um, <laughs> you know it's what my just- you know what my mother always told me. She said if you're unsure, then ask them what is the bracha, the blessing for bread, or say the Shema Yisrael, or ask them to recite a prayer, because if they're Jewish, they'll probably know these basic things. If God forbid they're uh, you know trouble they wouldn't know they wouldn't know these things okay okay that's good that's good um look there are there are dangers in Jew- getting in a jewish car too i've you know been in cars the guy's a terrible driver <laughs> <laughs> okay that that's what this is funny what she's saying everybody because you know um they're mediterranean drivers you know like italian drivers anybody in the mediterranean area they <laughs> You, I call them first generation drivers. <laughs> yeah, they could they could be going very fast down the road. That's true. Yeah. Okay, but the point that she's trying to make here, everybody, is that we're like one big country, and that uh, hitchhiking is uh, something that is safe enough to do in in uh, all over the country, pretty much. And uh, it's up to your own, you know, volition what you want to do, your own decisions. But uh, but that's kind of how it is. It's one big uh, family here. Natalie, we have like another minute left. In this interview, what would you like to leave our listeners with until you meet them the first time this Thursday, this coming Thursday? Well, I, I want them to listen and uh, please, you know, call in and 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 don't hesitate about that. And um, you know, whatever whatever uh, fear you have, set it aside because you only get one life, and you should do as much as you can. And this country is a beautiful place to be and come, you know, we, we want more of you. It's, it's, it's great. I'm so, I'm, I, I never look back. Okay. And, and I want to say here also, um, uh, Natalie is willing to talk with you. If you have doubts about it saying, well, how am I going to find a job? How will I know what, what happens if I move there and I don't find a job? How's my family going to eat? What's going to happen to us? Will you, will you, uh, you know, answer their questions or will you just, you know, how will you, I will answer. I will answer. And you can, you know, we can text afterwards. Um, I'll do the best I can. I'm, I'm just I'm just a human being. I'm just a mommy. But, um, you know, there are people who have been preparing for Aliyah their whole lives and they don't do it till they're much, much older. And, and I really think people should come when they're young and gutsy and have uh, love with them, their families with them. And, and and that's what it's about. You does, know? does that Not mean that everyone, senior citizens shouldn't make Aliyah? Everyone, no, no. If, if, but if you can come with a loved one, uh, a spouse, you should come. If you have, have friends here, come. If you have family here, come. If you ha- aren't as gutsy. I, I came here alone. I came here alone. So gutsy people will have it easier, you're saying. It, because you everybody know, should come. All the Jewish people should come. Don't, wouldn't you say yes? I think they belong here. And you should come. Yes, I do. I do think you should come. But don't think it's going to be just like moving, you know, 
the, you're moving to a new country. It's going to be having challenges, but it's it's sure. good. Yeah, it's all good. It's in the right direction. This is where we need to be. All right. Sure. Natalie Sapinski is going to be hosting the new show called Returning Home, airing live every Thursday, 9 a.m. U.S. Eastern Time, 4 p.m. Israel Time. Thank you so much for being with us, Natalie. Thank you. Tomorrow. All right. When we get back, I'm going to be reading to you some of my ideas, uh, how to get your spouse on board if they're not so sure yet, if they've still got uh, cold feet. We'll be right back. Shalom, everybody. Making a difference often takes just one moment and one person at a time. I am Orly Benny Davis, your show host on Israel News Talk Radios from Jerusalem with love. You'll be hearing people talking about politics, religion, social issues, and making a better tomorrow. Join me, Orly Benny Davis, for God and Country. From Jerusalem with love. Wednesdays on Israel News Talk Radio. All right, we are back here at the Tamar Yona Show on IsraelNewsTalkRadio.com. And I received a letter this week, an email from one of our listeners, and uh, I want to read it to you. Her name is Deborah. I'm not going to give out her last name just to protect her privacy. And uh, Deborah writes me, uh, Shalom Tamar, we've com- communicated. Com- <laughs> I need a cup of coffee engineer. <laughs> okay, uh, we've communicated a few times over the past months. I just finished listening to your last show while preparing Shabbat dinner, and I had to write you before candle lighting. You mentioned that you have tips to help persuade a reluctant spouse to come on Aliyah or to move to Israel. I would love to hear them. I have done our Aliyah application, but have not yet uploaded the documents. And my husband keeps saying we cannot go until we retire in 10 years. I agree with you, she says. We we don't have 10 years. I'm not even sure we have one year. I'd appreciate any suggestions. So I wrote down 10 suggestions here. And I'm warning you right now, everybody. Uh, I am uh, a woman, a female, and I think like a female. And so some of it might be a little bit devious, okay? But, you know, females get things done. We're very, very good at that. And you can take what I say or leave it. I'm being very honest with you. Take it or leave it. No, engineer, you don't have to get me a cup of coffee. It's okay. I'm just joking. All right. So uh, so I, let me go through this list of 10 things that I think will be helpful to get your spouse, if they have cold feet, on board with wanting to make Aliyah. Number one, talk about Israel and making Aliyah often. Do it every day. Don't be... Uh, annoying about it, but be very positive and excited with a smile on your face. Share success stories of other people that you know who uh, have made Aliyah or who are living there. Talk about their successful children or their successful lives or the interesting things that they're doing. We just had Natalie Sapinski on who was talking about how her child is going up uh, to uh, the the lake of uh, the Sea of Galilee and uh, with his friends and they're going to camp out there and, and it's safe, you know? So it's a wonderful quality, uh, very, uh, town of Mayberry type of life, if any of you remember the Andy Griffith show. So share these positive things. This will uh, bring reinforcement to the idea of, hey, there's another life waiting for us that's a good life. Okay. Now everybody's going to say bad things about Israel. Oh, I have a friend that made Aliyah. He came back after a year. He failed at Aliyah. Or oh, it's so hard there. Or or you have to live in such small house. Or you ba 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 ba. They're going to get that from everybody else. Your job is to reinforce and counter the negatives that they hear because there's negatives in everything. But that's not what you concentrate on when you want to get a goal done. All right. When you want to become a doctor, you don't 
concentrate on the negative things. I'm going to have to study so hard. I'm going to lose sleep. No, you say, wow, I'm going to work in a field I love. I'm going to help people. I'm going to learn uh, and, and make my, my parents proud. I'm going to make a good living. I'm going to have a, a very gratifying career where I, I'm, I'm helping the world. That's what you think about. The same thing here. Talk about Aliyah, talk about the success, and be positive. Number two, tell your spouse that it's not the Soviet Union. That if you decide after some time of living here that you don't like it or it's not working out for you, you can always leave. No one's going to put a gun to your head and make you stay here. All you need to do is pick up the phone or open up the internet and book a ticket back. Of course, it's not that easy, right? You're going to have to sell things. You're going to pack up and things, things like that. But the point is, is that it's not the Soviet Union. If you find that it's just not working out for you, you can leave. No one's going to make you stay here. You are not backing or painting yourself into a corner. Number three, talk about the Torah and the mitzvot. And talk about the importance of Aliyah. If you're coming coming from a religious family, this is something that is really going to hit the core of your spouse. If they really want to get close to God and want to be able to do all of the mitzvot, you can't do all the mitzvot, all of the commandments outside of Israel because you can't do the mitzvah of Shemitah. People who know what I'm talking about, they know what I'm talking about. I'm not going to go into it now because I don't have time. But uh, you can have and this closeness to God and to join your nation the nation of Israel, on a level you never, ever dreamed about before. And it's an adventure. Life is an adventure. And this is a wonderful thing. So to think, wow, I'm going to become closer to God. I'm going to do what God wants us to do. The exile, remember, was a curse. Remember, the exile was a curse, albeit in North America and in the Western countries, it might be a comfortable curse, but it's getting uncomfortable now because God is sending you the messages. That's what I believe, that it's time to pick up. And as Shifra Hoffman always says, pick up, pack up and come. Life is good here in Israel. Number four, start to form a Chug Aliyah. What is a Chug Aliyah? It's basically you have a group of people that you meet with every week or every two weeks or even once a month. Have them at your house for cake and coffee or you can uh, rotate it at each time it's at someone else's house and join up with another few couples in your area that want to make Aliyah and come together and you talk about it and you talk about where the other couples are now, where you are now, and it's very very, very um, good to see that you're not the only person or couple that wants to make Aliyah. There are other couples also that are planning to go and you network and you help each other. And it's also a nice social uh, evening with cake and coffee. And it's a very good positive reinforcement. Um, their excitement also and their enthusiasm in making Aliyah will rub off on your spouse. It has to. It's contagious. And your spouse can also see that others are doing it. And even though they may have some fears or doubts here and there, they're still doing it. This will give him extra strength or her extra th strength to maybe take that step. Number five, have people or connect with people already in Israel and have them call you and speak to you both about all of their experiences here. Make sure that they are positive people. So even when they may talk about bumps in the road that they had, that they will share these bumps in the roads as achievements and how they got over it and succeeded. You don't want to uh, you know, network with people who are, oh, I came here, it's so hard to do this, so hard to do that. Yeah, lots of things are hard. It's very hard, as I say, to have children, to be pregnant and to have children, to give birth and to raise children. But is it a bad thing? Of course not. It's a wonderful thing. It's a blessing. But there are challenges down the road. Kids don't listen. Kids don't break something. They cost a lot of money, sent to school, etc. But it's a blessing. Number seven, have your kids join Facebook or WhatsApp or other online groups where they can make friends with kids already here so they will want to come to Israel and meet their new friends in person. Leaving all of their friends behind when you leave is very sad, and it could bring anxiety to children and to families when they don't know what lies ahead in their new homeland. But if they have already a group of online friends that they can finally meet in person and go to visit and even sleep over at 
and make new friends. It will great, greatly reduce their doubts, their anxiety, and it will g- already give them a root here in the land of Israel and a social network to grow from that's already been established. Uh, number seven. Sorry, I just did seven. Uh, eight. Send your kids ahead if they're in high school age. You know that you do know, do you know that they have high schools here, secular and religious high schools for your kids. If you are in America and you want to send your kids to high school here, that is gives them dormitories and educates them for free, for free. There's, it's a program. If you want more information on it, let me know. I will send you, I'll try to send you the website of where it is. But these high school programs, get, get your kids to meet other kids from all over the world that came to uh, uh, live in Israel and learn here. They'll make friends. They'll learn Hebrew. And uh, they, it might even help prepare them for the IDF if they want to go into the IDF. And number nine, discuss it ahead of time in agreement with your spouse. This one's going to be kind of, uh, this last, this uh, number nine that I'm giving you, it's, some of you may not agree with me, and that's up to you. I, I give you that room to agree, not agree. You, you have to decide what's right for you, but discuss it ahead of time and with agreement with your spouse, the idea that you, the one who wants to move here, will move first. You and your, uh, your spouse will follow you here later, but you, to try Israel out, but sometimes when one spouse moves ahead of time to prepare the way, get things done, and build a foundation here in Israel, it's easier for the spouse who's dragging their feet still to come to, come to Israel to a home that's already been set up by their spouse. It's much easier to settle in that way um, and... Uh, and the motivated spouse who comes first probably won't get as down when they uh, arrive at bumps in the road and these bumps in the road come along. They would look at it as a challenge or, as I said, just a bump in the road, whereas the other spouse who's dragging their feet might get very upset about each uncomfortable situation that he comes upon. But the one who's really motivated that comes here first will be looking at it as, well, it's just another thing I have to get through. But if they already prepare the apartment, the home for their other spouse, and they come and join later, that might help. Also, number 10, if you are really fighting about this one issue and everything else in your marriage is good, a short separation, a change of place, and missing the other might do your marriage a little bit of good. It can, of course, go both ways. Nothing is guaranteed. But I do know that many marriages get enhanced also when the one spouse is gone for a short time. Distance makes a heart grow fonder. Again, only you can decide what you're willing to do and in a, de- in a decision like this with your marriage. But it has been done and it's been successfully done when one spouse comes ahead of time to prepare a home for everyone. We'll be right back. You're listening to Israel News Talk Radio. This is Shai Bentico, and each week I'll be webcasting to you from Judea, origin of the word Jew, a people besieged and beleaguered in every generation. Nazi Germany is but a memory, but in its place the world invented the phantom Palestinians as this generation's internationally authorized Jew killers. Tune in for a different slant on life in Israel. Phantom Nation, every Monday. Hi, I'm Rabbi David Aaron. The soul basics are the most profound, the most essential, and yet often the most neglected in our education. Join me for Soul Talk on Israel's News Talk Radio and discover the secrets to love, spiritual growth, and personal power. I'm reading a quote here from an article I'm about to uh, read to you all. It says here, we realize that Aliyah, or moving to Israel, is not easy. It wasn't easy for the post-Holocaust Jews arriving from Europe, nor for the immigrants who came from Morocco, Yemen, Ethiopia, and Russia. 
But you know what, folks, I can tell you, it's been a better life for them here, a better life for them here. I'm reading from an article from Arut Sheva, IsraelNationalNews.com called Hang Em High, written by Tzvi Fishman. You should go there and read the article and leave him your comments. All right. He says here, the leaders of the diaspora Jews did not prepare their people for what was seen as inevitable to any student of Jewish history and Torah. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu is not infallible. Yesterday, to his credit, he took responsibility for the current outbreak of coronavirus in Israel and promised to lead the way. A Jewish leader is responsible for the welfare of the Jewish nation. In the Torah portion of Balak, we learn how the Jewish people began to commit to commit history with the daughters of Moab, arousing the wrath of Hashem. And the Lord said to Moshe, Moses, take all the chiefs of the people and hang them up before the Lord against the sun. Rashi comments that the, Rashi is a commentator on the Torah, com- comments that the transgressors were to be punished, but the Zohar says that the leaders of the people were the ones to be hanged since leaders are charged with teaching the congregation to follow the paths of the Torah. This is kind of gruesome what we're reading here, but I think it's important to read his article and see what he's saying here. The responsibility resting on the shoulders of the leaders of the nation of Israel is also learned from the special sacrifice of their ruler, their Prince of the tribe, their Nasi, their ruler, must offer if he has led the congregation of Israel astray because of unintentional ignorance, termed shgaga, which is like making a mistake. Furthermore, the Talmud teaches, quote, whoever can prevent the members of his household from sinning and does not is seized for his sins of his household. I'm going to skip ahead a little bit here because I want to make sure I have enough time to read, every, to read as much as possible. Uh, in the light of this understanding, we, we must candidly ask, the author says of this uh, article, Tzvi Fishman, have not the leaders of, of the diaspora Jewry erred in not teaching their congregations that the goal of Tor- Torah Judaism is to establish Torah communities in the land of Israel and not in Spain? Germany, England, and the United States? Have the diaspora rabbis, educators, organization heads, and parents not erred in failing to encourage their congregations and children to make Aliyah and to participate in the building of the nation of Israel in the land of Israel and not to settle down contentedly in Gentile lands in Paris, Boca Raton, and Palm Beach, working to strengthen Jewish communities in the exile with the hope that it will, that it will last forever? You know, I want to say here a footnote that I went to Poland and Germany, and I saw the extermination camps, and I saw the old Jewish neighborhoods that are now, they they killed all the Jews, there are very few Jews left in Europe, and seeing what became of these grand synagogues that they had, and mikvahs, and yeshivas that they had, that that they have today in America, beautiful mikvahs, it's a a ritual bath, Uh, synagogues, etc. Today in Europe, they're furniture stores or uh, there are schools for non-Jews or whatever, all of this Jewish property that they were so proud about and look what we've built that they built in the exile has all been turned over to the murderers, the people who killed them. And people in America who think, well, look at the synagogue. We worked so hard to build it and this beautiful mikvah, etc. the schools. Let me tell you that Just as in Spain, it all went way of the church and to the Gentiles and in Germany and in England and everywhere else, the same will happen in America because America, as much as we love it, as much as a wonderful country it was, it is heading towards a very dangerous uh, uh, place right now where the Jews are ultimately, in my opinion, as a student of history, as the daughter of a Holocaust survivor, the Jews are going to get blamed because I look at history. Anybody who looks at history is sees the pattern. When the economy gets bad, 
the Jews are blamed. When there's a pandemic, the Jews are blamed. And we're seeing both of these things happening today. And the lack of government and the lack of law and order with the defunding of the police. There is no future anymore for Jews outside of Israel. The future of the Jewish people is here in Israel. This is where the future is. And though you still might be going to the mall and to your dentist appointments to get your teeth whitened and to uh, g- earning your the last year of your university degree or whatever it is that you're still doing in the exile, remember that the exile is a curse. And this curse is about to end. God is not going to send you a telegram, as I always say. You're not going to get a telegram. Dear Jonathan Goldstein, it's time for you to leave. It's not going to happen. God has already told us in the, in the Torah that this is the promised land. He created miracles for us when he brought us out of Egypt that he didn't do for any other nation in the world. He did it only for the Jewish people to extricate us out of this tuma, this uh, impurity that we were in, and to bring us into the promised land, the land of Israel, to receive the Torah, to take it into the land of Israel, and be a light unto the nations. It says in the Bible, in the Tanakh, that God is going to bring us back from the four corners of the earth on the wings of eagles. Now, our prophets that prophesied this didn't know what an airplane was, so they translated their visions into what they could express, and that was the wings of eagles, airplanes. And that is what is happening. And it has been happening since the beginning of the modern state of Israel back in 1948. But not all Jews will come. Not all Jews will be able to come if you wait too late. Because if that train leaves the station and you've missed it, you've missed it. How do you know you'll be able to come whenever you want? Already now, the skies are pretty much closed. It's very hard to travel today. Already now, with the coronavirus, offices are closed that you need to get documents from in order to be able to even apply for Aliyah to make it to, uh, to come to Israel. Let me continue a little bit with this article before the end of the show. He writes, we realize that Aliyah is not easy. It wasn't easy for the post-Holocaust Jews arriving from Europe, nor for the immigrants who came from Morocco, Yemen, Ethiopia, and Russia. And it will not be easy for the more affluent Jews from the West who are accustomed to life's comforts and who have not been prepared for the challenge and struggle of Aliyah because the leaders of the diaspora, Jewry, didn't prepare them for what was inevitable to any student of Jewish history and Torah. The exile was never meant to last forever, but diaspora Jews weren't told. When their rabbis and yeshiva teachers and federation heads retired, they moved to Miami Beach or to sunny Arizona and the five towns outside of Manhattan with only a few brave idealists journeying to the land of Israel. No one bothered to teach the Jews of the diaspora that they belonged in Israel, not Brooklyn. No one prepared them for what lay ahead. And now suddenly out from the heavens, the time has come. Finally, diaspora Jews are beginning to wake up from their sleeping beauty slumber. More and more Jews are signing forms to make Aliyah, not because they want to do what God expects them to do, Not because they want to experience Torah life in its most ideal expression. Not because of their longing to fulfill the Zionist dream of living in the Jewish homeland. But because they are afraid for their lives and for the lives of their children. And you know what? I'm going to keep you in suspense. I'm not going to read the end of the article. I want you to go there and read it yourself. It's on Arut Sheva, IsraelNationalNews.com. It is entitled... Hang him high by Tzvi Fishman. You can probably follow him on Facebook also. He probably posted it on his Facebook page as well. And if I can, I will post, uh, I will leave a link for that article on the show, on the page where the show is podcasted. I want to end the show with the following. That 
even if you're coming for the reason that you're afraid for your lives or you just don't want to see this uncertain future or you don't want to raise your children in a society like what the West is becoming today, I say, so what? Come. Any reason you come, it's a good reason because you're saving your life. If you're not there, you'll be safer. And if you're not there, you're doing the right thing by coming to Israel. That's what God wants us to do. He wants us to be here to develop the land of Israel. And as I said always, the future of the Jewish people is here in the land of Israel. And the longer you wait, A, in my opinion, the harder it's going to be, and B, the more expensive it's going to be, and C, the more precarious it's going to be. It's going to be harder. Who knows? Right now, if you come, you can ship all of your things out. You can fly here and get a red carpet welcome. You don't want to wait until you have to run out, God forbid, with only the shirt on your back. And if you think that I am an alarmist, I plead guilty. My father is a Holocaust survivor. My entire family, except for my father and his mother and brother, were wiped out by the Nazis. They were told, stay, it's okay. But we saw what happened. Be smart. Israel News Talk Radio's chat room. Just click the orange button at the top of the IsraelNewsTalkRadio.home page, log in as yourself or an anonymous guest, and join in on the fun. You'll meet other listeners from all over the world who listen to Israel News Talk Radio, and you can make new friends. Israel News Talk Radio's chat room. It's the closest you can get to being in the studio with us. We love listening to Israel News Talk Radio. Where can you get the inside news on Israel? At Israel News Talk Radio, we're dedicated to sharing Israel's inside story with the world by providing our listeners with news on Israeli politics, current affairs, and Israeli Jewish culture. The Israel News Talk Radio homepage also provides you, the listener, with useful information at your fingertips with scrolling news headlines, weather, currency exchange, Shabbat candle lighting times, and so much more. Our radio programming is always accessible and on demand. We operate absolutely free of charge for everyone, everywhere. If you love what we do, partner with us now by becoming an Israel News Talk Radio supporter. With your support, you'll be inscribed on our Israel News Talk Radio Wall of Fame. There's nothing like us in the world. Be part of something great. Israel News Talk Radio. Straight talk from Israel. If you love Israel News Talk Radio, then you'll love our Facebook page. We keep you up to date on what's happening in Israel, plus little surprise treasures that we don't share on the radio. Go now to follow us on Facebook. Just look for the Israel News Talk Radio Facebook page and don't forget to subscribe and follow us by clicking on the like button. We post great stuff there that you'll want to share. Israel News Talk Radio on Facebook and Israel News Radio on Twitter. News, opinion, and more. You're listening to Israel News Talk Radio. 